War in Syria, in Iraq, the rise of ISIS. As hostilities in that region continue to take a brutal toll, they've also led to grisly new money-making opportunities for terrorists. Loretta Napoleoni lays it all out in her latest book. It's called Merchants of Men, How Jihadists and ISIS Turned Kidnapping and Refugee Trafficking into a Multi-Billion Dollar Business. And Senora Napoleoni joins us now. Buonasera. Buonasera. Buenvenuto. Lovely to have you back here with us. Thank you. Let me start by reading an excerpt from the book, and this will set the table for our discussion mm -hmm. to come. You write, for the past 25 years, a false sense of security about the globalized world has encouraged young, inexperienced members, I will call them Westerners, even though they may be from Tokyo or Santiago, as easily as from New York or Copenhagen, to explore and report from every corner of the global village, as well as to bring aid to populations trapped inside war zones or plagued by political anarchy. These journeyman reporters and humanitarian aid workers have become some of the primary targets of modern kidnappers. Let's unpack this. Where does this sense of false security about doing God's work come from? Well, I would say the knocking down of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, all of a sudden we thought uh, that the world was uh, a much better place, a safer place. We could go and explore regions that before, you know, we could not, not even think about going to explore. But it's not true. Absolutely not. In fact, you know, the world was uh, a safer place. Uh, than it is today. I mean, think about what is happening in Europe, for example. People don't want to go on holiday in France anymore because they're afraid to be blown up. Uh, in the Mediterranean, people do not go on holiday in Tunisia anymore because they're afraid to be on a beach. People don't go and visit the pyramids because they're afraid. So I would say that the world has actually shrunk instead of you know getting bigger. Okay, so these people are over there, they're in danger, they're doing their thing, and now suddenly it has become profitable business to kidnap them. How did that happen? This is something that really happened after 9-11. I mean, there was kidnapping in, in a different way all over the world, but it was you know, mostly done by criminal organization. Then all of a sudden in 2003, a group of jihadists um, coming primarily from Algeria decided to have a go at kidnapping foreigners, tourists. They kidnapped 32 Europeans and they got about 6 million euros um, in ransom. Uh, so that's the beginning of you know, the hunting season. Because uh, mm. all of a sudden it became clear that you could fund an organization, an armed organization, by kidnapping Westerners. Uh, Why is it that people don't understand that the more you pay, the more this will continue, and therefore the more you will pay, and the more this will continue? It seems obvious on the face of it. Yes, you're right. I mean, this Amanda Lintol, that was yes. a Canadian that was you know, kidnapped, she says in her book, in fact, if you keep feeding the bears, uh, the bears will come back mm -hmm. for more food. But at the same time, it's a really important political issue because you know, government that doesn't pay, doesn't bring the hostages back home. It may be perceived by public opinion as a government that doesn't care mm -hmm. about its own citizen. This is why I talk about this false sense of security. So the government, um, the Western governments have not told us that the world is actually a more dangerous place because that would mean that globalization has no work. That would mean that the post-Cold War world is not as safe as the pre-Cold War. But at the same time, this government puts our life at risk. It's a really, really impossible dilemma. They put our life at risk and at the same time, they cannot confess that they pay for hostages, right? Governments, even to this day, want to perpetuate the fiction that they don't pay for hostages, yes. but they do. Of course, everybody pays. I mean, maybe not financially, maybe not in terms of millions. I mean, the US, for example, exchanges uh, uh, hostages. So if you get a soldier that gets kidnapped, uh, the US government will do anything to bring him back home, including exchanging. Uh, there have been several cases in which you know, Taliban uh, uh, who have kidnapped uh, Westerners were able, I mean Americans, were able to get people from Guantanamo back home uh, through exchange hmm. of hmm. hostages. So it's still a ransom. But we, t I, I think anyway, we tend to think of this as motivated by ideology, right? They are kidnapping Westerners mm -hmm. because they hate the West or they want to whatever. 
But you say it's simpler than that, right? This is just pure commerce. Is that right? Yes. I mean, this is why I talk in the book about criminal jihadism. Um, yes, there is a sort of ideological umbrella under which they do commit these kind of crimes, but then at the end of the day, uh, it is all for money. Uh, and what do they do with the money? W with the money, they keep the organization going, of course, but they also keep the economy of the region that they control going. So kidnapping becomes the primary source of revenues. Uh, for entire populations. So tell us, how's the, how, how does this work then? A, a Westerner is kidnapped by, let's say, an extremist uh, Islamic organization. A government can't be seen to be negotiating with the captors. So what happens? So you would have, um, you know, most Western governments have a crisis unit. Uh, so it is an organization which is within the government. Uh, uh, that generally works with the secret services, but also works with the Ministry of Interiors and the Foreign Minister, uh, which is specialized um, in handling the hostage situation. Uh, so this organization will start negotiating, uh, but generally governments, uh, they sit uh, on the negotiation for a long time. So if you get a private uh, company, a security company, uh, you will get much quicker and better results uh, because these are companies that of course you know you pay on a daily basis uh, the going rate at the moment is about three thousand dollars per day so it's you know big money to pay this company to negotiate yes with yes. terrorists absolutely Wh whoever we well, can be terrorists can be criminal jihadists uh, um, so um, there are specialized there are people that specialize in this kind of business and I call them in the book the negotiators mm. so the government uh, would try to find a way to negotiate, um, we will try to find a way also to pay the ransom without people knowing that he's paying the ransom. So sometimes the ransom is paid by allies, can be the Gulf allies, for example, who will pay the ransom mm -hmm. and then the money will be transferred in different ways. Or there are situations where embassies in certain places have um, a certain amount of cash in place all the time. Now, we, we understand that if you keep feeding the bear, the bear is going to come back. Mm -hmm. But would you say, after having looked at it, that it's ever a good idea to pay ransom? I would say <clears throat> that paying ransom is not a good idea. Ever. Ever. But I also would say that the idea of never to pay ransom uh, is an unrealistic idea because there will always be somebody. So it's sufficient that one government pays that they all think it's not going to work. Because it establishes a precedent exactly, and there we go. Exactly, exactly. So this is an area where global government, global governance is fundamental. Because everybody needs to be on the same page. Because if one country steps exactly. out, it exactly. undercuts the whole thing. Exactly. Can't governments just simply say, look, this is a terribly dangerous part of the world. Don't go there. If you do go there, you are on your own. Yes, they do. Some governments actually do that. But people still go there, uh, and then you still face public opinion. Uh, but can't the uh, government say, look, we warned you. We're washing our hands of this. We told you so. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But then you have to face the, the issue that why are those areas no-go areas? Uh, why have we gone to war in uh, Afghanistan, for example? Uh, why have we put uh, a democratic government in Afghanistan, and yet today Afghanistan is one of the most dangerous countries in the world? Mm -hmm. So you see, the governments, in order to face this problem, have to open up uh, a book uh, that they have kept closed for a very long time. They have to reveal mm -hmm. what has happened in the last 20 years. I know as I was reading your story, I was getting increasingly disgusted as I went through it at what you were revealing. And I wonder whether you were similarly getting increasingly disgusted as you learned about the things you were learning about. Yes, this was a very, very difficult book for me because it's all based upon original research. So I interviewed a lot of people. Uh, I interviewed negotiator, of course, but also I interviewed the victims, I interviewed the hostages, I interviewed the refugees, and yes, I was extremely disgusted. I mean, I've been dealing with terrorists for a long time. That's my area of expertise. Can we talk about one? Let's talk about one. Rashid. You want to tell us about Rashid? We don't know what is his real name. Um, 
but he, he came up to me when I was in, um, in Sweden. This was in uh, 2005 when I was part of this group that was fighting against this idea that the war in Iraq was actually a good idea. Um, and we did this um, sort of meeting for the refugees in, in the north of Sweden. Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful event where all these people came. And it was a sort of, it was almost a party, but in reality it was you know, a political meeting. Mm. And at the end of uh, this um, meeting, this guy came up to me and he said, well, um, I read some of your books, uh, and can we talk a, a little bit about you know, the Mujahideen? Because I think you know somebody in London. So um, I thought, wow, this is interesting. Um, but I noticed that he was a bit nervous about the whole thing. So I said, you know, let's go back to the hotel and, and have a chat. And this is when he told me a story, which was absolutely shocking story. Um, so he, he was a teenager when uh, you know, his father and his brothers were taken by you know, the military in uh, uh, Algeria. This is after the coup. Uh, so, so the mother sent him away to the south of the country with member of the GIA, which is you know, the jihadist organization from, um, from Algeria. So it, it was not a choice. <laughs> um, and there he became a smuggler. Uh, he didn't like that life. He, it was something that he had to do in order not to be arrested. Mm -hmm. um, and then he became a trafficker. So it, it was disgust. It was totally disgust by what he was doing, but there was no other way mm -hmm. to survive. So in the end, he came to Europe pretending to be a refugee. And because at that time, um, it was right after the beginning of the war in Iraq. The Europeans took a lot of Iraqis. He pretended to be an Iraqi, but in reality he it was, was not. And that's why he picked the name Rashid, which is a typical Iraqi name. Hmm. But that was not his real name. So he, he managed to get to, to Sweden. Um, and he managed to survive in Sweden. Uh, he integrated within a community uh, of Iraqis, uh, which were pretending to be mm. some Iraqis, but in reality they weren't, because there were a lot of people like him within uh, this community. So this kind of thing happens all the time? Absolutely. This kind of thing happens hmm. all the time, there because you don't know who they are. They don't have documents. There was another example that you gave in the book of somebody who had, it was a story of somebody who had perpetrated and was in on a kidnapping, and then said to the victim, "Oh yes, I'm so sorry." What do you want to pick up the story from there? Yeah, this was in Chechnya actually. Uh, this was an aid worker uh, from France who was uh, kidnapped by the Chechen rebels, uh, and he was kept in terrible condition. He was actually kept uh, in the dark uh, for most of the day, apart from 15 minutes. 23 uh, hours and 45 minutes yes, every day. 15 yeah. minutes of the day. He had a candle that burned for 15 minutes, and he could have his soup. That was all he could eat, of course, because you know they keep you also in a condition where you are barely surviving because they don't want to spend money to feed you. Then one day, a guy came, a new uh, jailer came, and he said, uh, I want to thank you for what you have done. Your organization has done for my family in Dagestan. Without your organization, my family would not have survived. And this guy was completely, completely shocked. As you would be. Of course, of course. So. He, he talks about soldier of fortune because he said he, he described this young guy. This also was another young guy as a soldier of fortune, and and you feel like these people have no choices. These people may commit crimes because they have no choice. We forget about this. Mm. But having said that, would you now go out on a you know and make a blanket statement saying no more humanitarian? workers go to these dangerous regions, no more journalists go to these regions, you are causing more harm than good. Would you say that? I would say that a lot of people that go cause more harm than good, because the moment in which you get kidnapped uh, and somebody pays the ransom, those are money that go and fund uh, these organizations. That go to kill more people and blow more Absolutely. things up. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. But that doesn't mean, of course, that we have to forget that there is this part of the world, uh, which is plagued by this horrible crime. I would say only professionals, highly, highly professional people, should go in. So if you've got a bleeding heart and you want to improve that part of the world, 
think of something else. There's a lot we can do at home. Right. I mean, the refugees are here. The guy, Rashid, <laughs> for example, is still in Sweden. He probably needs somebody or needed somebody to teach him uh, Swedish to help him integrate within society. You do not need hmm. to go to these countries to help other people. You can do it at home, uh, and you can do a very good job at home. Okay, that's kidnapping. Let's talk about trafficking in refugees. How lucrative a practice is that today? It's hugely, hugely lucrative. I would say that in areas of the world, uh, for example, the Sahel, which goes you know, from West Africa, you know, South Sahara, all the way to East Africa, uh, in many parts of this huge region, the population is kept alive by this kind of business trafficking. Hmm individuals. Uh, Mali, for example, you know, south of Algeria, part of Libya. Um, the same thing we can say about Afghanistan. The number two resource in Afghanistan after production of heroin is actually trafficking people. Trafficking people. Yeah, people that, of course, you know, we have traffickers in Afghanistan. You pay the trafficker in Afghanistan, and the trafficker organize your journey all the way mm. to the gates of Europe. Let's follow up on that, because clearly some people see a refugee crisis, and other people see a business opportunity. What businesses have sprung from this refugee crisis? I think the most interesting discovery uh, in these terms for me is this new form of criminality which has taken sh shape in Europe uh, uh, since the refugee crisis erupted. So you have small localized gangs in the different European countries along the route of the refugees which do the job of trafficking. So they will take you inside a country from A to B, and then you pay each time you reach your destination. Mm -hmm. This is a new form of criminality. This is not organized crime. It's a localized, a small criminal activity which has jumped at the opportunity to make money trafficking refugees, and it's very upsetting. Does it look to you like Western governments have got, and, and um, you know, security organizations have got their heads around this enough to make a dent in it? No, absolutely not. Um, number one, b because it's too destructured, it's too decentralized, it's, it's very difficult to find uh, who they are. Uh, it's everywhere, but also, uh, by disrupting this kind of activity, you will have to disrupt the flow of refugees, which, of course, pose a moral dilemma. Mm. Hmm. Uh, it's, this is the other difficulty, because this is a humanitarian crisis. Yeah. But at the same time, it is a new criminality taking shape. Where are you living now? I live in London. You're in London, England. All right, so this next question is perfect for you. Uh, as you watch the whole Brexit drama unfold, mm. how much uh, would you say the result of the Brexit vote was rooted in a lot of the issues we're talking about, the migrant crisis, the refugees that many people thought were just teeming, if I can use that awful word, through yeah. Western Europe? A lot. Uh, I, I would say that this was one of the tipping points uh, that made people decide at the last moment, uh, okay, you know, we're going to vote for Brexit. Why? Uh, because number one, it, it clearly shows the uh, lack of understanding of the problem um, from Brussels. Uh, but this is not necessarily because, you know, Brussels is run by people that are incompetent, absolutely not. It's because there is no foreign policy. We do not have a foreign policy. Um, so this entity, Europe, exists only financially, economically, but not in terms of politics. So the, um, the migrant crisis has shown to the average Brits that Europe does not know how to handle this problem. And therefore, it won't be able to handle even bigger problems. So it's not necessarily the fear that the refugees will come to the UK, because you know, the UK not being part of Schengen, um, it would be impossible for these people to reach the UK. But um, there, there, there clearly were fears about it, though. Well, I don't think it was necessarily the fear of them. It was the fear of um, the Europeans. 
the Polish plumber. Well, yeah, exactly. We got a massive, massive number of Europeans that moved to the UK since 2010, which was you know, the time of you know, the crisis, the big mm -hmm. you know, uh, European crisis. Um, and these people have come because, of course, you can get a job in the UK, in particular in the southeast, London and you know, the surrounding areas. So the, the Brits did not like that because, of course, these people mm, not necessarily take the job of the, of the Brits, but these people will produce um, an effect on salaries because mm -hmm. if the supply is so large, so salary will stay down. Mm -hmm. And that is the argument uh, of you know, some of the people that were pro-Brexit. But the real problem, I think, the decision to leave is not based upon that. I think the decision to leave is based upon the confirmation through this crisis uh, that Europe really does not have foreign policy. So Europe does not exist. It's like Kissinger's line. Remember Kissinger's line? You know, if yeah. I want to, if I want to yeah. deal with my counterpart in Europe, who do I call? It, yes, it's, it's, it's very much like that. Yeah. Um, so this was the, the, the. It was perfect for the Brexit because the migrant crisis happened in the summer of 2015. Mm. Uh, and then you know, the the, uh, the front, the anti-European front, used that as an argument hmm. in favor of you know getting out. Let me ask you one last thing. You 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 talk about in your book some pretty bad dudes, and you spend time in the course of your research dealing with some very dangerous people and places. Do you ever worry about your own security when you're getting involved in this world? Uh, actually, this is the first book in which I was worried. I mean, I dealt with terrorism. I interviewed a member of the Al Zarqawi group. I wrote a book about the Islamic State. So, you know, I did talk to sympathizers, supporters. Uh, but this time, I'll tell you why I was afraid. Because these are criminals. This is a criminal phenomenon. It's not a terrorist phenomenon. It's not political violence. This is pure criminality. Hmm. And you saw it. Yes. Well, we're, uh, we were very grateful when you made some time for us with your last book on Islamic State to come here. And uh, once again, we appreciate your visit here to us. Merchants of Men, How Jihadists and ISIS Turn Kidnapping and Refugee Trafficking into a Multi-Billion Dollar Business. Loretta Napoleoni. Mille grazie. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.